Hey there. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we had a bit of a technical issue when recording this week's episode of the Praxis Philosophy Throwdown. We invited the awesome Steve Patterson to come talk to us about his philosophy. Um, and we had a great call, but we lost the beginning of it. So I'm here to basically introduce it. Uh, fortunately, we didn't lose that much material. Most of the discussion is still here, but the beginning, the introduction was lost. So this, this call was with uh, guest Steve Patterson, who is a philosopher who works outside of academia. In fact, uh, he describes himself, I think this part we did lose, he describes himself as kind of an anti-academic philosopher. So he sees a lot of issues with the way that academia works, and he tries to rectify that uh, during his own personal work. Uh, he has a book called Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge. And he's somebody who, even though he calls himself a radical skeptic, he still thinks he has a proof for why there are certain kinds of knowledge that we can be absolutely certain of. And that's uh, a lot of what we talked about in the discussion. So as we as we kick in, we'll see, uh, I'm asking him a, a question, which is essentially an argument for skepticism, for a radical, uh, of total skepticism. And yeah, and you'll, as you'll see, he starts off by refuting that. And as we go through the discussion, we talk about other possible motivations for, um, for, for skepticism, any other reasons that we might have for adopting a kind of skepticism uh, to which he responds. So uh, this was a really, really fun call. Um, uh, personally, one of the more fun debates I think I've ever had. So uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Follow up. Uh, not necessarily that I would defend this argument, but I find it interesting to, to grapple with it. Um, somebody might respond and say something like, okay, but throughout history, uh, for the most part, when people do they stop abstracting and they get down to it and they get into the arguments and they go, you know, bam, bam, bam. And maybe even they might even reach a consensus. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. For the most part, they're all, they end up all just being wrong too. Yes. Uh, so, you know, and, and that doesn't mean let's not argue, but, but somebody might say that does mean have a bit more humility. Don't say that any of your knowledge is certain. Like yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. This is actually the reason I'm a radical skeptic is because I think most of our knowledge about everything is probably fundamentally wrong. However, there is one uh, uh, exception. There's one area of knowledge which, which that type of radical skepticism doesn't apply to. In fact, it presupposes. When somebody says, let's keep an open mind, what they're presupposing is, well, the truth is some way out there and maybe you don't have access to it, which implies that, well, truth is some way out there. So. There are, there are, skepticism has a certain amount of presuppositions nestled in it. And those nestled in presuppositions can't be wrong. You know, for example, I could say something like, throughout history, this would be a, a universal truth. Um, not everybody has known every fact of the universe. Okay, is that true? Well, uh, yes. Is that true now? Yes, doesn't tell you much about the world of the universe, but I think that is a true statement that would have been true thousands of years ago. <laughs> so that would be, there's all kinds of examples like that where very kind of silly, they don't tell you much about the world, but if you think about them enough, you can say, okay, now this actually is a certain truth or, or like in the book, even more fundamental than that, you know, all plants are plants. Yeah, it doesn't tell you much about the world, but that's true. It's always been true. If somebody disagrees, even if there's a consensus that some plants are not plants, that consensus is wrong. That is a true statement about something which is in all possible universes, that is a true statement. Uh, I want to ask one more question, sort of following this up, and then I want to um, open it up for other people to ask questions. So the last thing that you said uh, reminds me of the analytic synthetic distinction, which mm -hmm. is this uh, idea that, um, and for anyone who doesn't know, it's this idea that there are some statements that are analytic, meaning that the fact that uh, they're true doesn't actually tell you anything about the world. It just tells you uh, about what the words that you just use mean. So the, the classic example of this is um, all, um, all bachelors are unmarried. Mm. Uh, and the idea is, well, okay, that didn't tell me anything about the world. That just told me that what I already knew, which is what bachelor means uh, and what being unmarried means. Um, so when you talk- But it is true without- 
without so, doubt. So it is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the distinction is between analytic truths, which are true by virtue just of the definitions of the words, and then synthetic truths are truths that are not just about the definitions of the words, that are actually true of, of something, you know, translinguistic, let's say, mm, yeah. right? So, so, you know, when you give the example of like plants or plants, uh, that seems obviously true. It's also an analytic truth. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have a, a, an example of something that you think that you have certain knowledge of and it's not an analytic truth? Yes, um, but before I give you that, um, this is actually gonna plunge us straight into some pretty fundamental issues because for one, um, there is a line of argumentation which says that analytic truths are simply true by definition and therefore they're not even worth discussing. This is not the case. Analytic truths are incredibly important, arguably the most important actually truths I think in the entire world of philosophy precisely because people deny their truth. So I had a conversation with a gentleman from Columbia on my podcast. I forget which episode it was. Um, well, he was a dialetheist, and he said, well, talking about all bachelors unmarried, ah, what about the Pope? He said, the Pope is unmarried, but he's kind of married because he's supposedly married to the church. Mm, so he's married and he's unmarried. Well, if it's the case that somebody is saying there's an analytic truth that is uh, not true, <laughs> then it must be the case that we should say, okay, let, let's, be, let's all be on the same page that analytic truths are actually certainly true, that we're talking about bachelors in the world. They are the way that they are. They are unmarried because people disagree with that. Then I would, uh, uh, before I answer your question, I'm going to ask you a question. If we say that analytic truths are necessarily true just by virtue of the words that we use, why is that the case? Uh, why are analytic truths uh, true just by virtue of, of, of uh, the words? Yeah. Um, I think that's just a fact of how we use language. Could it be you know, otherwise? Like, I mean... Well, I think this, come, this also can come down to the individual, though. Like, if I was trained to believe this sound has a different meaning, then hmm. it's no longer true for me. Like it is language is subjective in that sense. Is that kind of what you're trying to get at or? So, so here's what I'm getting at. It is the case that analytic truths are true, uh, that all bachelors are unmarried, but the reason for that is the most fundamental principle in all of philosophy and the universe, which is the law of identity. Things are what they are, and it is not the case that they aren't what they aren't. Identity and non-contradiction. The reason that analytical truths are true is precisely because of the laws of logic. So that when we say, well, it's got to be that way, that bachelors are unmarried, that's how we use language. But yes, and the reason that that's the reason that we use language that way and the reason that it is true is precisely because of logic. That's the point of square one. So when you ask questions about why analytic truths are true, I think it takes you straight down to the fundamentals. And this actually is probably where we'd find some disagreement with people who think contradictions exist. Um, but let me ask, let me ask you, uh, answer your question about whether or not there are certainly true propositions that are not analytic. Yes. Uh, one at present, which would be that um, th the contents of my perception are going on. So that is a certainly true statement about metaphysics. I know some existence in the universe. I have certain knowledge that uh, there is orangeness happening in my mind. Uh, the mental phenomena are taking place. Now, it's not something and what we mean by mental phenomena, mental phenomena necessitates that you're taking place. It's not an analytic truth. It's a synthetic truth about what exists in the world, and it's certainly true. Cool. Uh, I could follow up forever, but I want to I open it up to other people. What other questions do people have, uh, objections, anything? Yeah, before, before we do get, get I think, into the weeds on kind of the paradoxathon and throwing it down with Steve on <laughs> skepticism, I want to apologize for the uh, interruption in the recording or interruption in the call here. I think my, my computer's had a few worldview crises because of Steve's revelations about <laughs> you know, Williams counter, counteracts about uh, skepticism. But yeah, I think, uh, I think we, uh, one of the goals of this call is we're kind of getting into is talking about this idea of you know, versus radical skepticism. So Steve has laid down an open challenge to any kind of paradoxes. We've covered a lot of paradoxes in these philosophy discussions we found. We found them to be very useful 
tools for igniting discussions around things like epistemology or identity or even ethics, uh, and especially metaphysics as well. So um, bring, your, bring your best. If you have questions for Steve about, you know, one, his work on uh, Square One or any of the other uh, videos and podcasts that he's been working on, or of course on these, you know, uh, various paradoxes we've covered, definitely, uh, definitely bring them. Steve has uh, laid down a challenge to basically leave no paradox unresolved if, by the end of this call. So we're gonna leave it open to you. If you don't have anything, William and I will jump in. We're gonna be like, real satanic devil's advocates um <laughs> yeah, going going crazy but, but before you guys um uh, do questions i want to i want to intentionally provoke you um i'm claiming that not only can all paradoxes be resolved i'm certain of it and if you think that there is a true paradox i'm certain that you're objectively wrong and i'm claiming that by the end of this conversation we can demonstrate it so if you want to stick that in my face and say, Steve, you're, that's the most arrogant, conceivable thing, do it. Now, I do that because this is the most important topic in the world. And all of philosophy, whether or not there are logical contradictions, is the most important question. So please. Uh, well, so, well, so stick a clarification, to if I may, actually. Um, yeah, I have a clarification question, too. I'll let you okay. go first. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Two clarification questions. And this is our fault for, for not inserting this a little earlier. I think mm -hmm. some of the interruptions kind of threw us off. But. I do want to kind of get your get your um, distinction, or if, if you have one, uh, between um, maybe different uses of the word paradox. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The word paradox is sort of being more or less equivalent here to logical contradiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, or, good. That, thank other, you. Other, other, other uh, uses. And then we, I think we can definitely launch into a very productive discussion. William, did you want to follow up on that? Uh, clarifying what you mean by paradox was also my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, paradox is an ambiguous word. Uh, the way that I mean it here, is to imply logical contradiction, specifically. Um, there are other paradoxes um, that are called paradoxes, but those don't have any real implication on uh, metaphysics. I mean, they're just like quirks. For example, in some sense, I can be happy and sad about an event at the same time. Ooh, it's a paradox. Yeah, but it doesn't, doesn't really get to the meat of what we're talking about. I'm claiming um, the most important questions about paradoxes are those which imply logical contradiction. I was really worried you're going to eliminate the emotional complexity from our life by like eliminating <laughs> the second kind of paradox. So I was kind of like, I was kind of concerned about that. So, <laughs> so that remains um, your emotional uh, complexities and some of the weirdness of life is still going to be there by the end of the call, but your logical <laughs> contradictions and your irrationalism may not. So right. <laughs> uh, floor is open. All right. I have, well, actually I have a follow-up question to something that you said partway through that introductory stuff, but I'm going to put, set that aside for a minute and come back to it because okay. I have a more relevant question right now. Why okay. do people believe they perceive paradoxes if those paradoxes don't actually exist? It's an excellent question. I don't know the answer, but I have some guesses. Here's my, my first guess. People are impressed by things they do not understand. If I were to say, there is a cat in front of me, and there is not a cat in front of me, lots of people go, ooh, wow, I don't know what that means, but wow, that sits so deep, it must have gone over my head, which means I want to sound smart by saying, yeah, yeah, I understand what that means. So I think that you see this with the quantum move argument, that people make ridiculous arguments they draw from quantum physics, and they don't want to sound stupid, so they don't make any challenges. So my guess is that people are drawn to contradiction precisely because it sounds uh, incomprehensible and mysterious. There's another answer actually that was that surprised me when I experienced it. Um, I had a long conversation years ago now with a guy actually it was after I wrote a piece on quantum physics a guy contacted me who I would say was a very aggressive irrationalist and he was trying to say no no logical contradictions exist we had this long conversation and by the end of it I got some really interesting information out of him that kind of disturbed me a little bit, but it makes sense. He essentially said, Steve, I know this is wrong, but I say it because it gives me power. And what he meant is, if people can, I, I'm essentially trying to break people's minds, that if people can act like, okay, other yeah, logical contradictions, like I can't even think for myself, this dude has totally confused me, yeah, I'm just gonna go with what he says. So he was essentially saying, yeah, I kind of know it's wrong, but I, I literally, it gives me power. <laughs> so I think there's some small group of really weird sociopaths who pursue contradiction maybe for that end because they want power. But I think, I think for the most part, it's just, it's just confusion. <laughs> I 
Cool. So, Steve, um, I'm not sure if this is really within the realm of the stuff we're talking about. I guess it is. But I'm particularly interested in kind of the concept of logic itself and how that relates to contradictions. Yeah. Specifically with regard to logic as being something that we use as limited beings. Hmm. And I'm not sure if, which I'm still what I'm asking, but yeah, I guess I come from more uh, a more reductionist perspective, not not in um, a materialistic type sense, but in more of a metaphysical sense of incorporating sort of our our limitations or the limits of under our understanding into our concept of logic, and okay. so I guess I'm I'm curious um, if if that's something you've explored uh, because it, it does have some interesting implications. Uh, I do find that there's this tendency to assume, I think this is where William and I disagree, that um, that ideas or concepts are distinct things unto themselves, mm. whereas I would tend to view them as um, sort of emergent from the properties of the universe, even if those properties extend beyond what we currently understand. Mm. And so, yeah, I'm just curious your thoughts on Okay. So what I'd say is logic is an ambiguous word and different people mean different things by it. Um, what I mean by the term logic is uh, sometimes ambiguous, but I call it the rules of existence. So I'm talking about something which isn't a human creation. I think it sounds like the way you're using the term, it's something like I would use like, like uh, rationality or techniques for rationality, things that we come up with to sort true from false. I'm talking about logic is much, is much, much bigger than that. So for example, for any existent thing, it is exactly the way that it is. I'm, that's not something I came up with, I'm saying. That's something I'm recognized, but that is a true statement about every existent thing. It doesn't matter if it's in my mind, outside in the world, some other universe, in multiple universes, it is the way that it is. So then the reason you, you could, um, rephrase that as the law of identity, which I'm claiming is a kind of universal external thing. So that's the way that I'm using the term logic. Um, in terms of the limits of rationality, I think, I don't know, it's not something I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about. Uh, my suspicion, I wrote a little bit about this in Square One, um, if it's the case that everything is exactly the way that it is, then it must be the case that we can know something about everything even if it's just a little something, we know that it, whatever it is, it is that way. So in a sense, our minds can wrap, our, wrap our, just a little bit of knowledge around every existent thing. So that, I'm not saying that we can know everything about everything, but it seems like there's, if there's a hard limit to rationality, I'm not exactly sure what it is. I, in, in my worldview, I, my guess is everything could in principle be known. If you had enough time and maybe a big enough mind. I don't yeah. know if that answers your question. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thought because kind of the path I've been going down is seeing, seeing logic more as, um, as an abstraction or, or in the sense of a, a simulation and of kind of um, classifying or um, identifying shared properties between, um, between things. I, I suppose you could say I've come around to a somewhat Randian um, metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I guess probably what we might end up disagreeing over or um, you know, would be just um, definitional in terms of our concept of, of truth. Because mm. yeah, for me, like when you say, when you say that um, the law of non-contradiction is true, I think I would tend to phrase that as the description is so broad that it describes everything. You know, that it's these, we take a description, say, starting with our limited experience of physical things in the world, and we broaden that description, and then we say, 
kind of like almost like it, how in math you can say, well, we'll take the limit as X goes to infinity. Well, we'll, we'll sort of stretch out that concept to be to incorporate everything and then boom, we have it. And so it might, it seems like it might just be um, a linguistic thing, but coming from like for me, from an engineering perspective, that seems to be like, that's like my, that's my preferred way of mm -hmm. describing it. Yeah. Um, I guess on that, I'd say I'm actually skeptical when people use the term all or they use the term everything. Sometimes they use that as if they're referencing one thing. And I don't think that's the way that abstractions work. I think that's actually an abstraction. Um, so I don't think that there is such a thing as the universe per se. I use that language, but I don't think it's one thing. That's an abstraction. We're putting a boundary around a whole lot of things, a lot of individual things. And that abstraction exists, but it doesn't exist separate of our mind. So when I say the law of logic applies to everything, I don't mean to say that the law of logic applies to the one thing that is everything. I mean that any existent thing is exactly the way that it is. And it's, this is something I'm not claiming. I, I'm not claiming that this is something we know from physical knowledge. This is something that could be otherwise. I'm saying that this is a universal law and, and it could not be otherwise. Um, can I ask for a clarification to that? Yeah. Um, where do you draw the line saying that this is like something that's too big to, you know, make an abstraction about? Because like you could make the same argument about a, a human body, right? Like yeah. we're just a, we're a collective, we're a collective of cells. We're not one thing. Is that? Yeah. So in, it's a good question. And my, this kind of gets into metaphysics um, and the philosophy of composition versus like simple, sub, simple substances and my metaphysics, what exists physically are base units of reality. The Greeks might have thought of them as atoms, but nowadays we might call them Planck units. They're like 10 to the negative 70 sized fundamental units of space time. Those fundamental units are arranged in particular ways throughout what this thing that we call a universe. And then those arrangements of matter, we label as objects, we label as things, we label as the human body, we label as different things. So, we can make an abstraction as large as you like, but what I'm claiming is those abstractions are entirely mental constructions. So like I have this water bottle here. My claim is that all that is actually existent without my mind is the bits of matter that are composed in a particular way that I call a water bottle. Just like with the universe, there's not the one thing. There isn't the water bottle there. There isn't the, the universe there. It's just all of the fundamental bits. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does answer my question. I have to think about it for a while before I can like continue to follow up on this train of thought because I just, I don't know, I have to try it on everything. Mm -hmm. it, I do want to turn the conversation back around just for a minute because I had, I did write down a follow-up question to something that like a, a side comment that you made partway through the introduction. Okay. Um, and I, I, I'm paraphrasing this, and so correct me if I, if I misunderstood you, but I think you said that you believe we can know some objective truth, and that the fact that we can know objective truth gives us some insight into the nature of the mind. So yeah. I, would I, have, I have two follow-up questions to this. One is, how can we know objective truth and why, and then what insight does this give us into the nature of the mind? So it depends on what we mean by objective. Um, here's what I'd say. If I were to claim that Chopin is the best piano composer, that is true for me. That is a subjective truth. Um, if I were to claim that in the universe, there exists one evaluation of Chopin as the best piano composer, that is now an objective truth. I'm not, it's not true for me, it's true for anybody. It's, it is a kind of a universal uh, true statement. So that's what I mean by objective. This is not something that's true for me, it's true for you, it's something that's objectively true. Now, what that means about the mind is that it must be the case that whatever the mind is, it has access to objective truth. Sometimes this is called the God's eye perspective. Uh, some people make the argument, they say, well, we could never know objective truth because that would imply we'd have to have the God's eye perspective. We have to get outside of our own minds and see whether or not the claims we're making about the world are true. Well, I'm claiming in some sense, we must have the God's eye. 
<laughs> because we can make certainly true objective claims. If it's the case we can make certainly true objective claims, then it must be the case we have the capacity to do so. Okay. Um, I feel like there are a million follow-up questions to that. Can, can you elaborate on that more? I don't know what direction to steer you down exactly, but, but what is this and why do we have it and how can you back it up? The mind, you mean? This, this capacity to understand objective truth, this God's Damn eye perspective. I, know. I have no idea. It's the most <laughs> ridiculous thing ever. I mean, consciousness itself, not just the capacity for reasoning and accurate reasoning about objectively true statements in the universe, but just the experience of life is totally ridiculous. Um, I, I, have, I don't have a good explanation for it. I'm trying to explain it in a coherent way, but I don't have a good explanation for it, uh, for its existence, or, or really what it is. I know certain properties about it, but I don't, I don't know what it is. Doesn't this kind of, I don't know, it feels like these are, these are things that you cannot tangibly prove. So this, this feels to me like we're moving into a grayer area of philosophy, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but... And I'm not opposed to this at all, but it's harder to back up claims like this. What specifically? What claims specifically? Well, talking about things that are not tangible, that you cannot go and actually like touch and feel and prove. You mean about the existence of the mind or the- Yes, the existence of the mind and the capacity to understand objective truth. Hmm. Okay, I would say I can prove, uh, anybody can prove for themselves is probably a more accurate way of putting it. Anybody can prove, prove for themselves that they have the capacity to know objective truth. Um, think about the contents of your experience right now. I'm assuming that everybody's looking at a screen. Be aware of the contents of your visual field. There's probably blackness, right? You're having a sensory experience of black. Is it the case that what exists in the universe, there is at least one conscious experience of black? Now, I think if you become aware of your visual field, you can say that about all the contents of your visual field. I can say with absolute certainty that there is, the, there is at least one conscious experience of what I'm calling blueness taking place right now in the universe. And if anybody were to claim that, any other part of the universe, they'd be wrong. I have direct insight into the nature of the universe and I can make it an objective truth by just saying it's something that's going on right now, objectively. So I'm claiming that as proof, that, that if, if anybody can do that about what's going on in their minds right now, become aware of what's going on in your minds and say that is going on in the universe and you must have access to objective truth. Now, in terms of what the mind is, again, it is, uh, it's not, a lot of people don't find it persuasive to talk about the mind in, in such mysterious ways, but this is the nature of the phenomenon I'm trying to uh, explain. I mean, I can't explain it away. There's this conscious undergoing all the time that's kind of a fundamental presupposition and I can describe it, I can describe my conscious experience, I could say, you know, um, it feels a certain way, I'm, I'm having a subjective experience, I appear to be some kind of a being that has thoughts and impressions in my mind, <laughs> in, in my conscious awareness, I can describe it that way, but if somebody's looking for something they can measure, uh, I, it's, it's, I can't give that to them. It's only something that I think can be done through introspection. If you doubt the existence of the mind, I think it's just a matter of introspection before you discover such a thing exists, certainly. Well, do, do you believe that there are any objective truths beyond the self, beyond your own analyzing of your consciousness that exists? So maybe that's like a physical truth or because based on what you're saying, I assume that you don't believe you can necessarily know if that water bottle even exists or if it's just an illusion that you're experiencing in your head, I assume I'm, 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 I'm under the impression that you believe you can only know that you're experiencing the visual, but you don't, and the touching of it might all be, you know, uh, a mental experience. Do you think that there's are any truths beyond that self? Maybe they exist. Uh, first, I want to know if, if you think they exist and if you can ever, or if you can know them or, or, or and if you do, what are those? You get, can you kind of get what I'm asking? Excellent question, yes. Um, so I believe that there exists an external physical world that if my mind goes away, that will still exist. And I also believe that there are other minds going on right now that are similar to my own. If I die, they're still going to be around. I don't claim certainty about that knowledge. What I can be certain about is the contents of my own experience. Now, that's a that is a claim about metaphysics. 
what we're doing when we theorize about the external physical world is we're trying to fundamentally explain the phenomena that we're experiencing. So the reason that somebody came up with the, the theory of the physical world is because they have sensory mental impressions. It is, the, it is the mental experience that comes prior to the theorizing about the physical phenomena. So in a sense, the mind, uh, uh, it, epistemolo epistemologically, is more fundamental than the world, what we think of as the external world. And I think modern thinkers get this backwards. They think what definitely exists is what's out there, and then maybe the mind does or doesn't exist. I think that's totally backwards. The only reason we posit the existence of the external world is because of the mental experiences we're having. Now, that being said, I do think you can know, in a sense, you can know something about um, an external world, but it's in a really abstract way. To the extent there is a physical world that is composed of base units of space-time, those units are in the position that they are in. They are composed in the way that they are composed. But I can say really abstract things. I can't describe them in any great detail because I don't know if that's the case. But if it is the case, then that's the case. Right? I have a whole set of logical, tautological truths that I can know are true. I just don't necessarily know whether or not the world corresponds in that way. Well, and there's um, back to the um, objective truth thing. I think the uh, maybe more reductionist perspective would be that for, for any non-homogeneous existence, a subset, uh, rather a non-homogeneous subset of existence must necessarily be able to simulate some other component of existence. I'm not sure what the word simulate, but what you mean by simulate that. Simulate meaning to, um, to utilize, utilize a shared property. So, you know, I would come at it from a, um, a bit more of a computational theory type perspective where for me, the, our experience can be considered axiomatic, but I would say not necessarily objectively true. Whereas the fact that we can access objective tr truth would kind of be objectively true. It's kind of interesting because of that um, simulation property. So if basically if you have distinct things, whether they be um, atoms or molecules or subatomic particles, the very fact that they're distinct and they're interacting according to the properties of the universe means that they can mirror the behavior of other, pro other, other things and other places and other properties. And so that whatever, from that concept, logic would be the most fundamental property of the universe. And we would have access to objective truth because we ourselves are composed of universe stuff. Hmm. And so, whereas I tend to go with the experience thing as being more axiomatic that we can't deny it without affirming it, but not necessarily objective in the sense that um, that, you're, that you're more that your more your material existence is objective. So I, I think uh, I think you and I are, are you just using words a little bit differently. Um, I do think that logic, in a sense, is kind of the fundamental. Um, unit or basis of existence but what i the 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 center point of my book is that logic and existence are inseparable you cannot have existence without logic and you cannot have logic applied to non-existence and the reason that logic and existence are, are inseparable is because of this in every case of existence you have existence which means you don't have non-existence now, if that's true, that means every existent thing is itself, which is the same thing as the law of identity. So I'm saying logic and existence are bundled, necessarily bundled together. And this is the other reason why contradictions don't exist. Uh, that um, makes sense. It, yeah. But yeah, well, um, I think I, I just tend towards uh, more, um, maybe more materialistic sounding explanation because I find that so many times when we talk about things like truth, it tends to uh, culturally bring up a lot of concepts of um, almost sort of a platonic type dualism mm -hmm. uh, 
or the this whole um, body spirit kind of concept that we see come that we have coming to us culturally from from our um, from our history of being very religious and that I find it, it things tend to kind of bend in that direction almost like the language bends in that direction and so sometimes I intentionally use um, analogies to computation or something like that to kind of snap it away from that direction. Yeah, you'd hate my metaphysics. I am a, I'm a, dual, I'm a substance dualist. I think the mind is, I am at least a dualist. I might even be an idealist. Mm. Where what I am certain of is the contents of my mind. And I, it is not the case that the contents of my mind are spatially extended. If there is spatially extended stuff in the world, if there is physical stuff in the world, that means it exists in addition to my mind. So that's why I'm a dualist is because I think that there's a physical world, but there might not be. It might be that all that exists is mental stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think you'd like my metaphysics well, very much. I don't, I don't think I don't think that would be a problem necessarily because okay. from because my concept of reductionism is is hmm. very um, broad in the sense of if it was just mind, then mind would be the thing that everything reduces to. Okay, yeah, yeah. If we have a broad enough term for yeah, the, for what we mean by mental, yeah, yeah. And it's a, yeah, it's another. Steve, I have a, a question for you. Yeah. So one of the one of the one of the strongest arguments I've come across uh, in favor of skepticism is what's called the uh, Agrippan trilemma. You familiar with it? Mm -mm. So uh, the Agrippan trilemma, created by a guy named Agrippa, who uh, was an ancient Greek skeptic, um, and uh, the argument goes something like this. Uh, in order to say that you know something, you need to have a justification. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Like if, basically you need to have some no. kind of a reason, right? Like you need to have a reason that backs it up. No. Ooh. Interesting. Could, okay. could we interrupt you, William, and have him explain why, or can you circle back to it later, Steve? No, I'll explain it exactly. Right. I, am a, I am familiar with the argument you're talking about. I didn't know the name. The reason is because there are fundamental truths which do not require justification, those truths which are necessary. So something being the way that it is is a necessary truth and doesn't, it, doesn't, it is not true because of some other reason. So there, there's this whole category of necessary, which means by definition it's necessary and not contingent. Uh, so, so just so that, so that everybody understands the argument, um, and then I, I want to see if I understand your response to it, right? Sure. The argument goes, in order to say that you know something, like you have a statement, you know, if you want to say that you know that that is a fact, uh, you need some kind of a justification, right? The knowledge requires justification. What is justification? Some other fact that you know, basically. That's, that, that's really the only thing that we have as justification is, well, some other fact that supports the fact that you are claiming to know. So the argument goes, um, well, there's three things that could possibly be going on if I claim to know X. Either I claim, either I know it, either that's justified by Y, which is justified by Z, which is justified by whatever, and there's a sort of infinite regress of justification that never bottoms out, in which case, then you didn't really know X because the justification didn't bottom out. Uh, or, you know, you have something where like, X, you believe X and it's justified by Y, and the reason you know Y, it's because it's justified by X. There you don't have an infinite regress, but you have like a circular loop of justification, and that loop also seems to be ungrounded, right? Like you believe this justifies that, which justifies this. They're just justifying each other, but there's nothing sort of holding them up, right? Or the third option is, uh, you know, you believe X and it's justified by Y, and you claim why doesn't require justification. Uh, that you hit a bottom level belief where that one doesn't require justification. So the way the, the Agrippan trilemma is typically put, you know, you have the infinite regress option, the circular option, and the dogmatic option. Uh, and those are the three. So would you say that your response to the Agrippan trilemma is, I take the dogmatic option, there are some truths that just don't require justification? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the term dogmatic. Um, I would say that, why are necessary truths necessary? If you understand the nature of what is meant by necessary, 
then you'll understand it doesn't require further justification. It's not but just see, an arbitrary but, but, assertion. But, but, it's but, not but, just but, but, some I, contingent hypothesis. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Not sure if you froze up or I did, uh, but. It was Steve, I, I, a little, Steve broke up a little bit there. Okay. You're, you're good right now, Steve. I'll let you know if I continues. And, and okay, I think I think your, your, your point came through. So I, I would say that when you say uh, necessary truths don't need justification because you're, you're now giving justification, right? No, 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 no. I, I'm giving explanation. I'm saying there is such a thing as necessary truths. And if you understand the concept of necessary truth, you'll understand why it is not the case that they get their truth value from additional premises. Let's talk about a specific example and, and, yeah. and, and use that to try to see like, is your, nece is your necessary the reason? It, it, could that potentially equal a reason, a justification? Sure, so um, every existent thing is exactly the way that it is. This is a necessary truth. Yeah, I can't see a problem with that. Well, so, 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 so would we then, so, and I'll throw this out to, ja to Jackson or anybody else. So, you know, I, first of all, you know, uh, the idea that a thing necessarily is the way that it is, I'm on board. I believe it. Uh, but the, so, so the question is, um, if we want to say that we don't need a reason to believe that, right? Oh, no, no, it, no, no, that's different. You're talking about justification for a belief versus belief. For, you're talking about persuasion. Do we need a reason to believe that? No, no, no. I don't mean, a, sorry, I, maybe I should have said justification again. I don't oh, mean okay. a reason like a motive. I mean a reason like, yeah, like something that just supporting, something that supports it, right? So if, if we want to say that that doesn't require justification, then are we willing to commit to the idea, I guess you are Steve, but I wonder what other people say, that knowledge doesn't always require justification, that there are some things that are just, we can know them for sure, and yet have no supporting evidence whatsoever. No, 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 I'm sorry. Before people answer, you're, you're, you're polluting the, the question there. Um, <laughs> it is not that we have, we have, we just shrug our shoulders and say, but we're just, here we have hit rock bottom. No, what I'm saying is understand what is meant by necessary. The, the reason that I have a belief that there exists necessary truths is because I understand what is implied by the category of necessary. So there's a reason for belief, which is understanding. That's not, it, it, which is different than saying, do you believe this for, because it's a contingent truth. Not all truths are contingent. There are some truths which are not contingent. Now, the reason you believe that is for, because you understand uh, how language works, you're, you're persuaded, you have a certain psychology, but that doesn't mean that those actual truths themselves need additional justification for them. And one thing that seems interesting to me with, with that argument, um, with the our group in trilemma, wouldn't it seem to presume in some sense um, the existence of mind as distinct from truth because it'd seem like if if it's saying that every if one of one of the um, to tackle at least the infinite regress possibility um, it would seem to treat the mind as somehow distinct rather than as incorporating truth or being part of the same system wouldn't it and so if you once you assume or once you accept that the mind is part of the same system that you're that is being examined by the mind then you have your basis in that i don't know if that's necessarily um implied i think it just depends I think we can make this work in whatever metaphysical structure we want. So we could say if the mind is separate from the world, we could still have descriptions of the world in, in a different system. Or if the mind is part of the world, then we have the mind as part of the world still making descriptions of the system that it's in. I don't think it necessitates a metaphysical distinction either way. I'm not sure, though. Maybe other, other people have other thoughts on that.
Um, so I, I want to follow up on, on this idea of justification just a little bit more. So if your response is that uh, some truths uh, don't require justification to know them because they're necessary truths, and if you understand what necessary means, mm -hmm. uh, then, then you will see why they don't require justification. Uh, as the, at least as, I, as, as I'm understanding justification, uh, what you're saying is the justification is the nature of necessity. So you have given a justification. I mean, that would just be, that's not how I would use language. Um, justification is necessary for, for contingent propositions to be uh, justified and reasonably true. Okay. There are, there are some well, propositions. Well, hold on. What, what, are, do you mean, what do you mean by contingent? Because I, I, don't, I don't mean. It, precisely that it depends on other uh, states of affairs. Um, so, for example, if I were a contingent so, truth. No, that's not, that, so, that, that's not what I, I don't mean contingent truths like, like uh, it could have been another way. That's, that's a contingent truth, right? Like it, it depended on states of affairs. I'm talking purely epistemologically right now. Uh, so, so, like. So, so in other to, words. In order to, it's just the idea that, so stick with sort of um, justification, not contingency. Just the idea that whether or not this is necessary or contingent. Uh, that you need a justification in order to be justified in claiming to know it. So, you know, let's say, for example, that, um, you know, okay, so uh, a plant is necessarily the way that it is. That's not a contingent fact, uh, but it is a contingent fact that I can know it, right? Like, let's say you, we, we agree that I can know that. that. It's a contingent fact that I can know it. Like, if I, for example, didn't have a brain, I wouldn't know it. Uh, so it's, so I'm not talking about the nature of the fact itself. I'm talking about the nature of our uh, having the right to claim to know it for, to know it for certain. Okay, right? so you're not talking about the certainty of the belief or the, the necessarily trueness of the belief. You're talking about us believing those types of things. I'm, right? talking, I'm talking about the justification for claiming certainty in the belief. Okay. Right. Uh, or, 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 really, or really just claiming any... So, so it's cla not justification claiming, for the belief, it's justification for the belief in the proposition. So it's about, it's not about whether or not some claims are necessarily true, it's about how we determine whether or not we're justified in believing those claims. I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking about our knowledge, not about the state of, not about the, state of the world. Like wh what I'm saying, like for example, like the Agrippan argument I think is perfectly consistent with the idea that there are necessary truths, uh, but eh, we can't know them because we can't, you know, because we get stuck in this justification loop, essentially. Okay, so I guess here, here, here would be my base level justification, maybe. Um, if it's the case that you have discovered a necessary truth, then you are justified in believing a necessary truth, because all necessary truths are necessarily true. That's okay. my justification. All right, and 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 sort of, and you and you don't, and I take it you were not going to, you don't think that that requires justification. No, because it comes from understanding the nature of necessity. See, it, there you started, is, but now you're starting to go in a bit of a loop. What's the loop? Okay, so you, in order to, so you justify uh, the fact that if you know a necessary truth, like, what did you, I forgot your exact words, but like, if you've, if you've discovered a necessary truth, then you're justified in, in believing that necessary truth. Why sure. is that true? Uh, what did you say? Because because uh, because I, of the, because of because of the nature of necessity. Like you're sort of just repeating the word necessity without really giving justification for the for the belief itself. Exactly. I'm saying there is a different type of proposition out there called necessarily true propositions. Which one once one wraps one minds around, you realize, oh, okay, this is not true for a deeper reason. This is not true for some deeper premise. Unlike if I have belief in Santa Claus, I got to I have to make a whole bunch of arguments in order to justify my belief in Santa Claus. But if I say something like, uh, you know, "All plants, to the extent that, that there is any plant anywhere, it is exactly the way that it is," that is not something which requires additional justification. I have found a necessary truth. This, you could say this with so, mathematical truth as well. Why is two right. plus two equals four? Well, if you grasp what we mean by the concept of two and the concept of two and addition and equals and four, 
you get it and you don't need further justification. So in a sense, you are saying, I mean, as I hear this, you're in a sense not even really arguing for the position. You're saying, essentially, this doesn't require argument. There are no arguments for it. Uh, you either see it or you don't, sort of. Uh, like, like you, do you, you have an art? Like, like, if somebody were to say... You could put you know, it that way. Like, like, I know, for example, um, I know somebody who... I know Grand Priest. So I know somebody who might... Uh, in some cases, reject the law of uh, not identity, but like the law of transitivity of identity, which is pretty basic. So, you know, if if I were to go to him and say, you know, sort of your your position, like, hey, that's just a necessary truth, right? And he says, well, I don't see it. No. Nope. Yes. Do you have do you, do you have anything more to say than you haven't wrapped your head around it? Then, like, do you have an actual yes. argument? Uh, yes, yeah, square one is the explanation. It's not an argument. It's an explanation. Okay. I'm not saying X equals X because such and such and such. I'm saying it is the case that X equals X. And if you want to understand why, then here's a way you can wrap your head around it. That is definitely what I'm saying. And there are people, th this is where I would say, and in polite, because I'm not an academic philosopher, there are people who are fools. If it is the case that somebody insists that A is not itself, Things are not what they are. Some things are in a way that they aren't. They are, I would say, fools. Now, that, it, it's not an argument. No, I'm saying that's also a statement of fact. Now, now I'm not claiming that everybody uh, upon the, uh, re, uh, hearing that the first time is going to go, okay, yes, I get it. What I'm saying is, look, get, get, pick up a copy of square one, understand the nature of necessity, and I think you will conclude the same thing. And, and I would also say this about the existence of um, mind. I would say, I cannot give the perfect argument that everybody is going to agree that the existence of mind. I can't do that. What I can do is say, work on your awareness, become aware, introspect, become aware of the contents of your visual field. I can arrange words in a particular way to try to lead somebody to that self-realization, but there is, if there is no self-realization, there is no argument I can get, give to get somebody to see what is, in, in that case, literally in front of them. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that's clear. Is anybody else? Uh, so uh, we're at 10.10. 10. Usually we go a bit over. So I don't know what your time, restri what, what your time restrictions are, so Steve. We haven't talked about any pa paradox, man. I'm going to stay up all night. <laughs> yeah. Every single paradox I want to get resolved. I was just going to change the subject in that direction. Steve, <laughs> our first philosophy throwdown was on the liar's paradox. Can you please explain to me why the liar's paradox is not a paradox? Okay. Start so, with, start with, okay, I, with what, what it is also, in case anyone okay. doesn't know. All right, this sentence is false. Is it true or is it false? Well, it's claiming that it's false. So if it's true that it's false, it's false. But if it's false, it's true. The reality has just split into many parts. There's a black hole in front of me. Um, the reason that the liar's paradox is not a logical contradiction is because it is the case that one of two things happens with the liar's paradox, and I actually am going to um, put it in the chat for guys if you want to, if it's easier to follow along. Um, it is either the case the liar's paradox kind of explodes to infinity, or what you could say is it collapses to zero. The way you, you can see this is by breaking it up with parentheses. So here's the sentence. This sentence is false. The question, which gets to the heart of the liar's paradox, is which sentence exactly is false? Is it this sentence, the words, is false? Or is it that the claim is this sentence is false, is false? So I'm claiming these are the only two options. Is either the case that the liar's paradox is claiming this sentence is false, or this sentence is false, is false? Both of those turn out to be linguistic errors. They are syntax grammar errors. They give the illusion of sensibility, but they actually um, collapse under inspection. So we'll take the first one. Um, imagine that I would say uh, the liar's paradox is claiming is that this sentence is false. Parentheses, this sentence is false. Okay, pretty easy to see. This is not. This is neither true or false. This is just two words. This sentence and saying it is false. But the two words, this sentence is not a claim. It's like me sneezing and saying is false. It's just two words, not a proposition. Okay, is that part clear to everybody? Does anybody object to that? 
Good? Okay. The only other option is to say, well, what the liar's paradox is really saying is this sentence is false is false. Okay. So if we look at that, we say the claim is that something is false. It's saying there's something in the parentheses is false. We investigate what is it that's in the parentheses, and we're left with this sentence is false. Well, if what is being claimed is this sentence is false, again, we have it either collapses on itself, in which we have, we're saying this sentence is false, which doesn't make any sense, or you input it to itself. And we're left with this. This sentence is false, is false, is false. So, okay, well, what, hang on, what is this sentence? Well, if it's this sentence is false, then you've got this sentence is false, is false, is false, is false, is false, ad infinitum. Wherever you stop that generation process, you're, it's gonna collapse on itself and you're gonna, ha you're gonna have the words, this sentence, or you're gonna have the infinite, the infinite regress. So what I'm claiming is neither of those is a proposition to evaluate as either true or false. It's a syntax error that gives the illusion of sensibility. But let's keep talking about it if that's not clear. So just not, it's just nonsensical, basically. It, yes, you could put it that way. It's nonsensical. I like to say it's a non sequitur. It's like, it, you know, shoe is false, like, but that doesn't make any sense. And I know there's one, one of the main um, objections that um, is that while well, you're saying it's meaningless and it clearly has meaning, I know William's writ written about that, but um, I think- Wait, I'm sorry, it, cl it clearly has meaning? Yeah, in the opinion of some. I'm not saying oh, okay. Um, okay. But I see. I think my my argument, I, I this is based on what I read in in, um, in William's post on the topic. Is it because our brain our brains and we are not pure logic machines in the sense of the way we process information, then it can both <laughs> And this is not a contradiction. It can both have meaning and be meaningless because what we mean <laughs> that that's, that's partly a joke, but um, when we say that something has meaning or that our, our brain can make something quote meaningful of it is different than saying it's a logically coherent thing because the way, I mean, the words have meaning that yeah, this exactly. is the word sentence is Okay, but that doesn't, that there's no logical problem there. Exactly. Yeah. English, English words are English words. Yeah, and so I think there's, um, there's kind of a, an error in that. <laughs> I just read that, by the way, this one. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's an error in that because there's an error, I guess, again, linguistically, in the way we define meaning when if we say that oh it's meaningless and eh, or it's meaningful and it's a contradiction okay well get let's get rid of the word meaningless that's a bad word uh, the the yeah. words have meaning yes but it is not it is a non sequitur it is claiming either this sentence is false is false is false is false ad infinitum which is not something you can do it doesn't make any sense yeah or it is the, saying the words this sentence is false so it's not a coherent claim though yes technically the words have meaning yeah, so, I, well, I get, I, I agree with you completely, Steve. I'm just kind of curious to hear um, opposing views on that one. Yeah. So, um, I have a lot of issues with this, with the, with that view. I've written a couple of actually articles on my blog uh, on on this particular solution, uh, yeah. and there's a so there's a link right there, and and from that article you can link it links to other ones as well. Okay. Um, my main problem can be summed up with the with the fact that in order to say, so so you are in a you are saying that it is meaningless. I understand why you made the distinction. You're not saying that the words in it are meaningless, but you're saying that it's it's not a proposition when you it's, put it together. It's a syntax error. Right. So, uh, well, it, well, in order for it to be a solution, you do need to make you need, you do need to make the stronger claim that you know there's a syntax error that is causing it to not actually be saying anything coherent, right? Uh, you are, in fact, making the claim that the sentence is not actually saying something. I am, if I were to say the square circle, those words have meaning, but it's not referencing anything. Well, it's also not making a proposition. So uh, is your okay, claim the that the circle that, is in front of me? Okay. Uh, and that's nonsense. I, I, now, that's nonsense, depending on how you mean by, the, yes, the words have meaning, but okay. there's a problem but, but, going on. But, but, well, but do you claim that the sentence overall is not actually making a statement? There is not a coherent proposition. 
Okay, great. This sentence is not something that could be true or false. Okay, great. Yeah, so, so I, just, um, I just sent a, a little sentence to the chat. And that sentence goes, uh, right now your eyes are making a specific set of horizontal, mo horizontal, uh, horizontal movements that allow you to read this sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you can do your analysis to this sentence and show and prove that there's a syntax error in the sentence and that this sentence is therefore not saying anything coherent. Um, no, and here's the reason why. Not every case of self-reference explodes to infinity. Uh, our minds are, are, uh, are very clever. So for example, if I were to say, okay, this, this is, a, this is an, a, a quicker example. Okay, does this make any sense? This yes. sentence has five words, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if we were gonna be strict on what the, what the words they're actually doing, this falls into the same problem. This sentence has five words, what sentence? Mm -hmm. This sentence has five words, has five words, add and fine. But mm -hmm. our minds don't have to do that. Here's what our minds are doing. That this is a, it's a clever part of the mind, but here's what they're doing. The suspense is killing us. Wow. <laughs> it's Seriously. a long one. <laughs> the following set of words contain five elements. This sentence has five words. That's sure, what your mind sure, is sure, doing. Sure, sure, so, but, so this, but, but, but the thing is that you can do the exact same thing that you did to the liar sentence. No, you, to this. no, you can't. Sure, hold no, on, hold on. Okay, hold on. And you can do it again. Okay, well, okay, here's the difference. False is a different claim than has five words, right? So what we're doing, if you, stick with the parentheses for a minute. So this sentence has five words, has five words. Imagine you see that for the first time. You have content within a, a parentheses, you have content outside of the parentheses. The content outside of the parentheses is not, is not a claim about true or false. It's saying what is in the parentheses meets this certain criteria. You could also say it are there English words. There's, mm -hmm. there's no problem with that. So that doesn't generate to infinity. That's a perfectly, I, I can look at the sentence I just wrote and say, I can make sense of that. The sentence has five words, has five words. Great. That's mm -hmm. not the case with false. I could say this sentence is false is false. And then I look within the parentheses and there's no truth claim because we run into the same, the same error. This sentence is neither true or false. So, th so this sentence has five words. This is an English sentence. These things don't explode to infinity and you can make sense of them, right? Does, does, right, guys... but, but, okay, but you're placing, you, so your attitude uh, places this sort of burden on the liar sentence, which is that any use of this sentence has to be filled out, right? That, that's the whole premise of your solution is that you have to fill out this sentence and say, well, which one? No. Right? I'm saying specifically when you're making a truth claim, the claim is this sentence is false. Mm -hmm. False means there is a proposition that is false. So what is the proposition that is false? And you're left with this sentence. Mm -hmm. But if we do that with this, we're saying this sentence has five words, has five words. Oh, okay. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about this sentence has five yeah, but, words. But, but, I'm, but, 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 it's, but, but we're not just talking about this collection of five words. We're talking about this sentence. The sentence, this sentence has five words. That is what no, we're talking no. about. No, no, it's not. Look, let me show so you. So you're, you're sort of changing the meaning of the sentence and making it no, mean no. this no, collection no. of words is, 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 is five in number, which is Your not what the is sentence doing. is saying. Yeah, look. Your mind is doing this. Your mind is doing this, comma, so I, sentence, comma. So I'm yeah, saying my, my, my mind is not doing that. My mind is interpreting that as an actual connected sentence, not just if as a collection of five words. If you're making sense of this sentence has five words, what your mind is doing is saying in the parentheses, it doesn't matter what's in the parentheses. It could be, it could be Chinese symbols, it could be French. It could, you're saying in the parentheses contain five elements. That's what your mind is doing. That just so happens that the elements that you've chosen appear to be a sentence. This sentence has five words, but you're talking mm -hmm. about the words, the actual words. There's no contradiction there. I can make perfect sense of that. It's a clever thing that the mind is doing. Imagine, if I, imagine I were to say, 
I say, I don't have, I can't type in Chinese symbols, but imagine I would say, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I imagine I had three Chinese symbols. I said, were Chinese, are Chinese symbols. We have no problem understanding our, our Chinese symbols, right? In the parentheses, that makes sense? Now imagine it just so happened to be the case that those Chinese symbols stood for, these are Chinese symbols. Mm -hmm. right? it's, a, it's irrelevant, that, that's a quirk. That's pre precisely why it's confusing and a trick. Right. It's because right. it appears to be this thing that, that has self-reference, but we can make sense of it with no problem. We just put commas in the place. We could do the same thing right. with English words. These are English so, so, words. Yeah. So, but, yeah. But, but the thing is, you're, what you're doing, so I understand what you're doing, it's making the case that this sentence has five words, right? Just that sentence, okay? Is not actually a statement about itself as a sentence. What I'm it's saying only is, a statement about itself as a collection of words. But see, in order no, for it to be a statement about anything, it has to be a sentence. Claim. Not my okay. claim. It's not my claim. What I'm saying is when you put those words down, your mind is doing something. Okay. What the sentence is doing is not what your mind is doing. When you write those words, it's going, whoop, this sentence has five words, has five words. Or you could put it the opposite way. It's saying the following set of words in parentheses contains five elements. Boop, 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 boop. And it meets that criteria. Right, 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 right. So, 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 so you are so saying that my mind, is, so you're yeah. saying that my mind is translating the meaning, the intuitive meaning of the sentence to a different meaning. But this is the intuitive meaning. That's the only way you can make sense no, of it. No, the intuitive meaning is that that is actually a sentence and that it's just about itself as a sentence, not just as a collection okay. of words. Okay, so let's, let's be clear. When I say this sentence is in English, what does that mean? It means that, that, it, very, that, it, it means that that very sentence that you just uttered is in English. Okay, what, is, what does it mean to say is in English? Does it mean the words are English words? That's ambiguous. It could mean that it's just that the words are ambiguous, or it could mean that it's actually a coherent statement of English. What, what is ambiguous about it? That what we well, mean can, by kangaroo. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. Wait, yeah. wait, wait. If I were to say, "This is a French sentence," what that means is the words are French. Not That's necessarily. What, it means. I, what no, does I, that mean? I, I could explain to you what, what's ambiguous about it. What's ambiguous about it is that it could just mean these are English words. Okay, or it could mean this is a coherent statement of English, okay? So if I say kangaroo, five, tree, those are English words, not a coherent statement, okay? Uh, so, that's, so, so that's the difference. So when you say this statement is in English, uh, you could be saying simply these were English words, or you could be saying this is a coherent statement okay. of English. So, so those are different things get, to say. I want to get some perspective here, okay? So we have this we have these words that we're assembling. We're saying, okay. So what we've done is I've just assembled words. I put them in the chat box. The two competing scenarios. One, what this means, what your mind does when it reads these words. This is what it does. This is what it does. The words, this sentence is in English, are English words, which is exactly, of course, what it's doing. That's what everybody understands what it's doing. Or it's the case that reality is contradictory. <laughs> uh, we can't know anything about anything. This is, we have okay, one do, clear, do, do have you want me to explain to you the other? Wait, wait, wait. we have okay. one clear way to make perfect sense of this sentence. This sentence is in English means the words, this sentence is in English, are English words. Makes perfect sense. Or we're saying, no, no, actually, this is a true contradiction. Why would we choose the irrational not, I'm, interpretation I'm, over the rational one? I'm not saying necessarily accept the contradiction. Uh, okay. I'm, yeah, I, I'm simply, yeah, there's, and there's actually no contradiction in, in this sentence is in English. Uh, this, even if you interpret it as saying this is a sentence, a coherent sentence of English, that's just a true statement. That's not contradictory. Um, so... I'm not saying anything is contradictory. So you gave one possibility. I think another, which is just as plausible, and I think a lot more intuitive. I think what people actually think of, when their brain actually does, when they think the sentence is in English, is, you know, is... Okay. 
that is at least as plausible as what you wrote. Um, That's not, when, when somebody reads this sentence is in English, their mind doesn't go, oh, what that means is this sentence is in English is a coherent statement of English. That's not what's going on in their minds. That's well, the fact, the fact that it says this sentence, right? The fact that it says, it doesn't say this collection of words are English words. It's this that's sentence. What, that's what right? your so mind it's, is. It's stating, when, it's, when it's, I say this bottle is in front of me, what, actually is, what I actually mean is the bits of matter that are there. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I'm but saying- that's, Yeah, but see, when I say two plus two equals four, I'm not talking about like the bits of two in front of me, nor am I talking about the symbol two, I'm talking about the concept two. Okay, similarly, in this sentence is in English, I'm not just talking about these words or the utterances, I'm talking about the concept of a sentence, which is distinct from the concept of a collection of words. So, so if somebody were to come up to you and say, this sentence is in English, you're saying the intuitive answer is that what that person means is, this sentence is in English is a coherent statement of English. That's right. I respectfully disagree. <laughs> okay. I, I don't understand how that even, nobody uses language that way. What we mean by well, this- well, Okay, okay, well, it depends, it depends on what you mean by, it, it depends on what you mean by like, uh, you know, uh, I, I would submit, what comes I, up in your I, mind, right? So I, so I think for either of us, I think for either of us, if somebody says this sentence is in English, we they wouldn't think mean, twice about it and we don't translate it, right? We don't like think, what did that person mean? Did he mean five that's words? That's what or did philosophy mean- is doing. How do we make sense of it? It appears to be the case. Look, this is the perfect illustration. When we say this sentence is in English, it seems like we can make sense of it. And the reason it seems like we can make sense of it is be- precisely because our minds go, this comma sentence comma is comma in comma English are English words. That's what the mind's doing. That's why it makes sense. And then people say, well, maybe we could do that with false. Maybe we could say this sentence is false. And then, and, but we could make sense of the one. Why can't we make sense of the other? That's why we're illustrating this. That's why there's a problem, because you can't do that. Because false doesn't, is not the same type of claim. With false, you have to go in and see what the actual proposition is inside, inside of the parentheses, right? Well, yeah, well, you're sort of now going back to the, to the point about false and whether that's somehow like sort of special. Uh, my, 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 I just want to make sort of uh, the point that when something says this sentence, right? Mm-hmm. It's clearly stating of itself that it is a sentence. No, what it is doing, it, it is generating something in your head. You can write down the words and what it does is it generates a concept in your mind. And the mm-hmm. clever thing about the words this sentence is it can apply to itself. So when we write this sentence, our brains are doing That's what our brains are doing. That's clever. That's cool. I'm glad I can do that. We can say, imagine those were blue. I could say these words are blue. And what that, when you read it, your mind goes, oh, that, those words are blue. It doesn't, it's not, that's the way we make sense of things which appear to be self-referential. Is we, there's, there's this, you read it and then there's an arrow that says, oh, we're talking about that. Which is why when we say these are English words, those are English words, because that's what our minds are doing. Right. Yeah. So, um, there, so there's a, there's a, um, theory of, of description, which says that, you know, if I say, for example, uh, the, if I say, for example, the ball is green. Yeah. Uh, implicitly in that is, uh, there is a ball and it is green. Right. Uh, you're, you're sort of like, you, you don't necessarily consciously think of it, right? But you sort of take it for granted that part of that claim is that there's a ball in the first place, right? When they say the ball is green, well, you must be talking about some ball. The square circle? So when you say the square circle exists, you are clearly saying that a square circle exists. Okay, but I'm not actually referencing something. Well, you, yeah, so, so, so in your case, you're saying something false. Uh, in, in that case, you're saying something false. Uh, but... The idea is if you say the square circle is square, right? What you're saying is there is a square circle and it's square. Now that statement may be absurd. It may, it, 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 in fact, you could easily say that's a silly statement because there is no square circle and it's implied in what you're saying that there is a square circle. There can't be a square circle. So that was, that was a silly thing to say. Okay. In fact, you could say it was false because there is no square circle to begin with. 
Okay. Right. Uh, again, similarly with the green ball, the green ball, uh, the ball is green. Okay, I'm assuming that what you mean is there is a green ball. That's the one I'm talking about, and it's green, right? So similarly, you know, or if I said uh, the green ball is big, there must be some green ball that you're talking about that is big, right? So when we say this sentence uh, is in English, right, it is implied in that this is a sentence. And it is in English, right? This very thing that I'm saying this is, is exactly, a sentence. This is exactly what I just said. You read the words and then it goes that. That's, that is the magic. Right, but the, but, but the point is that it established, it, that it, part of the claim is that, okay. is that not just the words are in English, but that it is actually a sentence that has been uttered. So it's interesting. It just it popped in my head when you're saying the sentence says of itself. Okay, let's be clear. Sentences don't say anything. Right. Okay. Sentences, you're, you're, we're trying to say, well, what is it talking about? That's not how language works. Sentences mm -hmm. are words that elicit concepts in our mind. Mm -hmm. Sentences don't talk anything. So you can write down yeah, words yeah, yeah, that make yeah. you think, of, if, if I write down, um, let's see, if I write down the word Valerie, okay, that does, it's a, it itself isn't say anything. Well, the concept in my mind is going to be different than the concept in your mind because I'm thinking about a song by the Zootans called Zootans, I don't even know how to say the name, called Valerie. Everybody's heard it. Why don't you come on over, Valerie? Yeah, that's yeah. the one I'm thinking of. That's what comes, that's the concept that comes to my mind by the word Valerie, right? So there's a difference between the word and the concept. When I read the words, this sentence is false, I have a concept in my mind that says that sentence. So that's what I'm talking about, that. And then I look and I say, this sentence is false. Well, that's not a truth claim. It's saying, it's saying two words, this sentence, and then it's saying is false. That, that's a syntax error. Uh, all right, so um, we are starting to go a little bit in circles. Uh, I love this discussion. Cool. Uh, and I don't see any circles anywhere. I, <laughs> I see, it seems very clear to me. I, I wanna see if anybody else, if there's any other, am I not being clear about this resolution? There should be a full resolution. We have a sensible interpretation for why we can understand words that this sentence is in English, and then we have some other claim about we don't actually mean that, and then logical contradictions exist. Is it, it, what, let's keep, let's resolve this until it's done. This is absolutely critical. Yeah, I'm just curious, William, what's your, what precisely is your position on this? Re regarding what? Regarding the liar paradox the in general? Yeah. Uh, so my position on the liar's paradox uh, is that, for one, I haven't thought about it or studied it enough to be, have a, uh, a confident position, uh, but I do lean toward the dialetheist position. I do think that the sentence is, in fact, it, it, well, I think it most, makes most sense to think of it as being both true and false. But do you view that as being a, an error in language or an error in logic or an error in reality? Uh, if by reality, you mean sort of physical reality? Absolutely not. Yeah, in fact, okay. so, so, so uh, with regard to dialetheism, people have different views about dialeth like different sort of approaches to dialetheism. Uh, I don't think that there are, I don't think that there can be any contradictions with regard to things that are, uh, refer to the physical world, right? I don't think that the material world can be uh, in a contradictory state. I think that that is absurd. Uh, however, when you have uh, concepts that are simply just man-made concepts, uh, I do think it's possible to essentially twist them around into contradictory uh, states. And I don't think that only said, that doesn't say anything other than how we've ended up sort of developing language so this is an error this is a human error that has caused this this you could look, co you, this you conflict could look. so so wait a minute does this so when we look at a paradox and we say wait a minute like everything that everything that i know starts to fall apart like if i can't believe that this is true then you know what else what else is it true so this is this does not mean that the laws of reality are falling apart it just means that the way that we perceive the world is falling apart our logical systems I, I i don't think that anything is falling apart it just means that uh within a certain class of propositions you could you could come out with the value true and false 
Okay, uh, so can I ask some questions about this? This is very important. Um, sure. So when you say a proposition is true, what does that mean? Uh, it means that, uh, essentially it means that I accept it. Accept it as the case. So when you say something is true, that means you believe it? Uh, if I say that something is true, do I believe it? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so one aside would be this, this would be an interesting use of language. I think most people are talking about reality. They're talking about the world when they're talking about truth. They say something is true. That means what it is claiming about the world is the case in the world. So that's well, I, well, well, I, well I, I made a very, uh, uh, I made a very specific point to say, to make a distinction about physical reality versus, versus other things. Right? I, I so, make no such distinction. I'm talking about the entirety of things which exist in all realms. Yeah. So, so I'm, so I'm, yeah. So for all things, if they are true, that does mean I believe it. Uh, my distinction was simply that when it comes to statements about or corresponding to physical reality, uh, I don't think it's possible for them to also be false at the same time. Are there true and in the things, same way? Are there true things that you don't believe? Um. Well, are there things that I think are true that I don't believe? Yeah, by that definition. Yeah, um, I think probably, yeah, I think probably uh, the liar sentence. Okay, so, so you would say outside of the liar sentence, we'll come back to that. You would say mm -hmm. that there are, what is, things are true means I believe them, which means that there is no such thing as a true thing that you don't believe, right? I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable saying just outside the liar. I'm, uh, when it comes to statements that are limited to the physical state of reality. I'm, talk, I'm yes. not talking about the physical state of reality. So most okay, people- yeah. So limited to that class uh, of, of propositions, yes. If I think something is true, that means that I do believe it. And it also means that it is not the case that I don't believe it. Okay. So when most people- you, I think virtually everybody, when they're interested in pursuing the truth, they're not interested in pursuing what I believe. They're interested in pursuing the way that things are in the world. So a true proposition for most people is something that corresponds to the world. So to say what is true is what I believe is something that nobody else uses language that way. Um, I'm not saying that's therefore used language another way. I'm just saying you should be aware well, that I, I, nobody else. I, 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 I'm only saying that there's a distinction between what is true and what I believe is true, because there are many things that I believe are true that are false because I'm wrong about a lot of things. That, that's all. That's the only distinction that I'm making when I say I believe. Like it's very possible that there's something that I believe is true and it's false. And it's not because of contradictions. It's just okay. because I'm wrong. <laughs> so this is a, this is a great, uh, a great segue. What, what does it mean when you say something is false? What is that it mean? is not the case. So it's not the case or it's, or you don't believe it. Okay. If something is false, it is not the case. If I believe something is false, that means I don't believe it's the case. Okay. So if something is true, that means you believe it. No. Okay. Sorry. So maybe, so maybe, so maybe, so maybe, so maybe I misunderstood you. So maybe I misunderstood you at some point. Yeah. No, no. What does it mean? If something is actually true, that means it is the case. Okay. to do with my beliefs. And what does it mean that, so you're saying something is true, that means it is the case. Something is false means it is not the case. That's right. Right? Okay, so what does it mean to say that something is the case and it is not the case at the same time in the same way? It means precisely just that, what you just said. Okay, so what do you mean by not the case? What do you mean by something is not the case? What does that mean? Because what it, I think it means to everybody who uses language is it is a so, negation of a proposition. If I say it is not mm -hmm. the case that I'm perceiving a pink elephant right now, that means precisely the opposite, the mutually exclusive opposite of I, it is the case that I am seeing a precise, uh, that I'm seeing a pink elephant right now. So to say that I am seeing it and it is not the case that I am seeing it is an incoherence, is it not? Uh, so let me go back to that for just, uh, I want to just make a quick uh, clarification because I've actually look, uh, looked into this. Uh, there's plenty of empirical evidence showing that uh, 
but the people in some cases are perfectly comfortable with contradictions. Uh, there's been lot, there's been like surveys. What done do you where, mean? Give me an example. So like people have, have been asked, have been given a picture where there's like a, I think a circle next to a line or something and have been asked, uh, to evaluate the claim that it is, that the circle both is and is not close to the line in the same sense at the same time. And, 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 and people said, I think they were allowed to evaluate the truth of that claim from one to seven and more people said seven than anything else. Yes, of course. So, yeah. so, and I only point this out, I, 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 I only point this out because you, no, 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 you can't say that most people are comfortable with contradiction and give that example. That is an example of most people are aware of the ambiguities of language. If you were to phrase the contradiction clearly and say, is it the case that the line is next to the circle? And it is, it is, is it not the case that the line is next to the circle? Like, are you affirming and negating at the same time? Nobody would say that is the case. No, that's that, is precisely, that, that, is, that, is, that is precisely what they said. Who in the world? Okay, I would love to see that study because I've never encountered somebody that say, I am affirming X and I am negating X at the same time. I've met plenty of people that would say, yeah, the, the, is this, see, I'm not very good with colors. Here we go. Is this blue or is it green? Well, yeah, it's blue and it's green. It's blue and it's not blue. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course they say that. That's ambiguous language. That doesn't mean it's a people believe in the existence of contra logical contradictions. But that is a contradiction. You just you just gave a contradiction. That is blue no, and I not didn't. blue is a contra is exactly what a contradiction is. One, one second. One second. <laughs> Wait, I'm so I'm curious, Will. Uh, yeah. The universe is about to be split apart again. <laughs> if if I'm hearing you right, what Wait, can, I, I'm sorry, can I have a prop this time? <laughs> okay, ready? This is pink. This is pink. Mm -hmm. This is not this. Therefore, pink is not pink. It that, is, that's, not a, that's not a valid, that's not a valid argument. Isn't. What that's do you mean? Valid... It's, it's pink and this is pink, but this yeah. is not this. Therefore, yeah, no. In, in, in order for that to be valid, your first premise needs to, needs to say not just this is pink, but also only things that are exactly like this are pink, which you and didn't have as a premise. Did, and that's obviously and it, an, not a true premise. And, so if, that wouldn't have and if you did the, the same thing with people in that study, they would have the exact same response. That yes, this is what, this is, it is blue and it's not blue. That's what people mean. It is blue. Yeah, it's on the dividing line. It is exactly the way that nobody, nobody would say, this is a logical contradiction that we are staring at. They're saying, this is a color that is on the border of my categories for language. Sometimes I describe it this way, but it, it's not quite that way. It's not quite this way. So I am going to just call it green and not really green. Nobody says, but it isn't the way that it is. Nobody uses language that way. I completely reject the idea that, that somebody would stay with a straight face. This is an example of a logical contradiction. So, um, Will, is what you're saying essentially that we can write down, say, x equals not x, but in the real world, x always equals x, but we can still write down x equals not x is that what you, I mean, is that kind of the heart of what you're saying is that we can say, we can say absurd things? Um, that's, that seems kind of self-evident. It's like, oh, of course we can say absurd things. We, or is the claim that most people are comfortable with an explicit logical contradiction, saying that this isn't the way that it is, that most people would be okay with that? So let me take one at a time. Uh, so uh, Nathan, um, no, it's not, it's not j quite just that. Uh, but that my, my claim is, my general claim is simply that if our propositions are not referring to anything in the world itself physically, right, but are just essentially referring to linguistic creations, uh, we should not be surprised if something like a contradiction pops up because, again, that was, that's not actually just, that's not reality that's showing itself to be contradictory. It's just the language that we use that's showing itself to be contradictory, which is not so surprising. You know, when we had Graham Priest on, uh, one of the, the most convincing things I think that he said is that, you know, sometimes you have legal systems that are contradictory. You know, you come up with a legal system, you don't realize it, but then it turns out that, you know, this law says you should go to jail, this law says you should not go to jail. And, you know, what, what does that say? Does, it say? does that say something magical that the world is contradictory? No, it just says that, oops, we created a, a contradictory legal system. 
So but my claim is essentially that that's exactly that, that we should not be so surprised if the same thing happens with language because language is not a magical thing that's like deeply connected to the world. It's just, it's, it's just an emergent feature that developed in us through evolutionary imperatives. So that, that seems almost um, trivial. <laughs> Trivial. Yeah, because, yeah, well, I, I agree. It seems like essentially what you're arguing is that we can accidentally smuggle in x equals negative x or wor or not x. X does not equal x claims into some complicated logical mess. And uh, I don't, I don't see anything uh, that seems totally trivial. Uh, trivial, like of course, if I have you know some giant equation or series of mathematical whatever. I can write in there accidentally because I don't understand the full extent of what I've just written. I can write a statement. Or you could even do it intentionally, uh, fully understanding yeah. what you're doing. But the point is, but the, my point is exactly that is that when you, you know, you can, you can, you, you can bring in contradiction into the, into, into the, you know, system of representation. Like you can have, you know, you can have as your premise uh, a kind of contradictory thing, whether you realize it or not, and then, you know, contradictions yeah, so come I up. Can, I can say X does not equals X all I want, but that's, it's absurd. I, I think my counter, not really even a counter, but just my clarification or understanding that would be that, okay, I can say absurd statements, but they are absurd. They are yes. of no... Yeah. I, I and, and, is, and, 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 and the liar is exactly that. Yeah. That the, no, that the, the dialetheist position is that a contradiction is not a demonstration of error. Dialetheist position is well, contradictions arise, and sometimes we just have to deal with something being true and false at the same time. This position, well, uh, if, I, if you, I, I, if I don't you find think a contradiction, that, you've made an error. Um, that's it. That that that's interesting. Um, I think that. So. My position is that it's not necessarily, I, I don't have a claim, I don't claim that it's necessarily quite an error. Uh, uh, my claim is that, is that it's a feature of how, we've, uh, how language has developed, that we have developed it to, ha to yield sometimes contradictions when we're talking about just linguistic things, hold on. And so, and so oh. hmm. it's not necessarily that it's a, an error, because that brings in a whole, like a value judgment, like maybe it is an error, but the point is just simply that um, if you're, that if we're trying to represent how we in fact use language, how language has actually developed for humans, that uh, you know, your, this, your system for doing so will, should leave room for, for, for contradictions uh, in these cases, because that's what our language does. Okay, so is there a difference between uh, the claim, sometimes we can contradict ourselves and it's an error, well, I can say the square circle exists, but that's a mistake. Versus... So, so sorry, sorry. Let me let me just. So uh, I'm curious about your st your your stance on on the square circle exists, um, because you know, if we're talking about the square circle uh, in reality, right? Like a here's an instantiation of a square circle in physical reality. Uh, I think you can say there's a square circle there, and you are necessarily wrong. Right? Why? You're necessarily wrong. Uh, because physical reality does not instantiate contradictory states of affairs. Talking about a, an instantiation in your mind. Let's say it's not physical reality. Yeah. So, so, so I have no, yeah. So I have no problem with saying that. It, in fact, a square circle does exist in my mind. And what is that? <laughs> uh, it's a square circle. What is that? An object, okay. a, ment a mental object in my mind. A, a, a mental object that it's not an image. It's not an image. I can't it visualize has... it it has contradictory properties and it is actualized in your mind. That's right. You see, and this is why I'm a reductionist because I think if you're not a reductionist, at least on a very broad metaphysical level, I think you end up with, quite frankly, bullshit like that, where like... So hold on, because, hold on. So, so the thing is, the human so it, mind has the capability, to cre has the capability for imagination uh, and to create fiction uh, to come up with all kinds of things, right? And I can say, for example, the infinite, and there's no such thing as the infinite, but I can say the infinite, and just when you ask me what's the infinite, I can give you some properties. Oh, it, doesn't, it goes on forever, um, you know? And, and, and these are just ideas in, in my head, right? Like if I try to build something corresponding to them, it's not gonna work because reality doesn't work that way, okay? 
but in, but, but in the mind, you can come up with all kinds of stuff. You, you think you can have a coherent, clear, and distinct conception of a thing that has mutually exclusive properties. It is some way and not that way at the same time. I didn't, uh, I didn't say it was clear and distinct. Um, what, I mean, you can, what's the difference between I can say the words a square circle and a square circle exists in my mind? What's the difference? Uh, what's the difference between, okay, between I can say there's a square circle and a square circle exists in my mind. Um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into like the ontology of ideas, like what is, does, does two exist in the mind? I, I think that abstractions, yeah, I'm not really settled on, on the ontology of this, but, but basically I do think that it's convenient to speak at least of uh, abstract ideas existing in the mind. Now, what does that mean existing in the mind? I'm not really sure. Like, it's not like a, uh, like, it's not like there's like a, an ex a special dimension called the mind, right? So, uh, but we have ideas. Let's grant that we have ideas, okay? And I do think that one of the ideas you can have is of a square circle, which is just that you have an idea that there's an object and that it has the property of being a, a circle and we know what the properties of being a circle are and it has the properties of being a square and we know what the properties of, of, of being a square are. It so would, it has it has properties that it doesn't have in your mind. It has properties. Yeah, that it yeah. Just like Harry Potter has a thing over here, even though that doesn't actually happen to people. No, that's not the same thing. There's no, there's nothing incoher incoherent about that. And you have to talk about the, have to talk about the ontology of ideas if you're talking about there exists a logical contradiction in my head. But see, I can say perfectly co consistently. Yes, Harry Potter has a scar on his head. What is Harry Potter? He's an idea in my mind that yes, he's not a physically existent thing. I'm not a, I'm not a physicalist. There's nothing, I cannot say Harry Potter has a scar on his head and it is not the case that Harry Potter has a scar on his head. That is not talking about anything. That's incoherent. But literally, that is the definition of incoherent. Yep. Affirm and negate at the same time. Well, okay. So if the definition of incoherent is affirm and negate at the same time, then trivially what I'm saying is incoherent. But that's not how most people mean incoherent. Yes, it, is it, is. It's, 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 it is contradictory. It is not incoherent. There, there's, the a, there's a there's a coherence. Different... Coherence means it's lack it's... of contradiction. Yeah. Okay, so most people, certainly most philosophers, uh, don't agree with that. Uh, if that's what you mean by coherence, then sure. Then my, then what I'm saying is incoherent. What is coherence if not logical consistency? Understandability. Okay, how do you understand something with contradictory properties? You just wrap your head around it. Well, no, you just, you just do. That's like that's like that's like saying that you understand x does not equal x because you can write it down it's it's the same thing you're you but, are... but it's not that it's not just that i can write it down it's that because it's simply an idea i can just posit it just like i can say tom has a red shirt and even though i can't see tom and i don't even know who tom is i can tell you that he has a red shirt because i just made him up similarly i can say x is not x because i just made up x no Nope, there's a difference there. The difference is you can coherently say without any contradiction or any revising of logic or metaphysics that Tom has a red shirt. He's a fictional character in our head. We're just making him up. Be That's great. We cannot, cohere we, we cannot coherently say Tom has a red shirt and it is not the case that Tom has a red shirt. I have affirmed and negated. You can say those words, but it is the definition of not making sense. There is no other standard that you can use to say this is this is incoherent there's an error here other than the standard of logical contradiction yeah this, so, this so, is, so, so, so at this point so one, more thing, one more thing one more mm -hmm. thing i do want to give an explanation because no, people don't do this enough this is an explanation for why the principle of explosion holds this is the thing this is big in dialetheism that supposedly you can't derive everything from a logical contradiction yes the reason the principle of explosion is true is because when you undermine the mutual exclusivity of true and false the whole system falls apart you can't, that, the whole, the whole system is based on the mutual exclusivity of true and not true and the meaning of our words. And when you start saying in some circumstances, things can be true and not true at the same time, the system falls apart. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to put aside the whole explosion thing because uh, explosion is a pretty sort of technical issue. And that's not really the reason that we have explosion. The reason that we have explosion is because of disjunctive syllogisms, which only no. make sense if you already no. are 
All right. So, so hold on. So I, 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 no point in getting into that. So, okay. um, so, so, so at this point, we're just sort of now we're just going sort of back and forth, saying it's coherent. It's not coherent. It's coherent. It's not coherent. So, 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 so we need some kind of way to arbitrate whether what I'm saying makes sense or not. Because I'm saying I make sense. You're oh, saying right. I don't make sense. And right. so we, we sort of hit a. But right. I'll, I'll give you the standard. This is why I make the distinction between rationalism and irrationalism. There is one objective standard, which is a rational standard, which is logical coherence. That is the standard for understandability. What? You cannot, you can think that you make sense of a square circle because you can say the words, but it is not the case that you have a clear and distinct conception of what a square circle would be. So let's agree on coherence because I don't want to slip back into coherence means uh, no contradiction because then, I, then trivially I'm incoherent. So let's actually agree on coherent before we go forward. Okay, that's what I mean by coherent. So, and you can have so, so, a clear and distinct non-contradictory concept in your mind is what coherent is. Okay. Sure, okay. all right. Yeah, so, so, so I'm claiming that, this, that the idea of the square circle, his name is Timmy, Timmy the square circle, uh, clear and distinct. So uh, not visually, by the way, I never said I can picture Timmy, um, but clear and distinct. So. You, you know, your, your, your sort of only claim at this point is to say, you know, I mean, you can say, no, you can't. It's not clear and distinct, you know, but you don't have access to like my mind. So we're at, we're at a, a bit of a standstill, right? Well, and I think, I think it has to get to the, you know, we have to sort of talk at this point about. It, it, it is not the case that every uh, argument is going to be resolved. If you have abandoned the standard of logical coherence and you're saying sometimes I can say things but I and haven't abandoned the opposite but, 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 hold on. and it's but, still but, be coherent, I cannot persuade you. There is but, nothing I can persuade you if you've given up the law of identity. Yeah, but I have not given, first of all, I have not given up the law of identity. Uh, second of all, you're, our, our you're hold on, hold on. You're also giving, you're also sort of like switching back and forth, right? Like I, uh, I didn't give up on the law of coherence. I make, uh, on the standard of coherence. I'm claiming that what I'm saying is coherent. I certainly do not claim to say that, you know, we should just talk about incoherent things. So, okay. if I, okay, so William, you're saying, if I get you correct, you're saying that our concept of a square circle exists in some meaningful sense of the word. Just my, as a concept, yeah. Just as, as a, a concept. See, here, mm -hmm. here's my thing. I would say that Timmy the square circle exists in exactly the same way as X does not equal X exists. I agree. Which is to say that it is, we can make the symbols, but it's a logical absurdity. And we're... Right. I mean, depending on how you mean logic, logical, right? Yes, you could say that that's a logical absurdity. But again, my point is simply that we create concepts by fiat, right? And so long as we understand the words that we're using and we understand the ways that we're putting them together. So we, I understand the word square, I understand the word circle, uh, I understand what it means to be a property, I understand what it means to, to instantiate, I understand for something to be an object, I understand what it means for something to have two properties at the same time, right? I understand all of those moving parts. They all, they all mean something to me, right? And so Timmy, the square circle is just me adding to all those concepts, you know, instantiated in one, right? Now, can I picture that? No. Can something like that exist in physical reality? Of course not. Is, there, not? Any use, is there any use to this? Not really. Um, but, you know, I mean, you could just call Timmy the Square Circle, along with the liar, just a really esoteric genre of fiction. But I would, it's I would, fiction I think that makes it's straight up false. No. What's that? Well, well, Harry Potter is also false. That didn't happen. Mm. No, and here's why. Here's why. Because Harry Potter, at least the existence, or the rather, the existence of the physical attributes of Harry Potter is making, when you unpack the language, is making a claim that is attached to reality. Now, the magic part, you could go in and say, yeah, well, that's an absurdity. But the actual being, you know, it's, it's making a claim that a 
he, that a real life person it's like it's saying if there was a person i don't think anybody can i well can i correct one term that you just used nathan i don't think we should say attached to reality because i think that implies that i think you could take that to mean is attached to the actual reality that we're experiencing which it is not but all of the propositions it makes are consistent with each other it is not saying anything within its 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 proposed worldview that is contradictory in its proposed worldview. So I guess in essence, what I'm saying with regard to Harry Potter and the fiction stuff that <clears throat> the things that are quote non-contradictory about Harry Potter are the things that could be real, that could be a description of the real world. The contradictory things that are absurd are it depends what, it depends what you mean by could, right? Like uh, I don't know that it, does it, it, do we really want to say that it could be the case that the events of Harry Potter happened? I mean, no, that's what I'm saying. Like the, the magic components, okay. the components that do not line up with the real world are an absurdity. They are the smuggling in of X does not equal X into okay. it. And so we play with these things, but they're not actually, they're, they're incorrect. I agree with you 100%. And, 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 and similarly, I can say that- actually exist. 100%. So, so it depends what you mean by exist, right? So of course they don't exist, right? Uh, I, get, I simply mean only as a concept in somebody's head. That's all that I mean by exist. And that, so, 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 you know, don't take that to mean, I don't think that Timmy the Square Circle has any more reality than Harry Potter by any means. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you just a couple of quick, we'll have a quick dialogue here. Why is it the case that you say it's obvious that square circles don't exist in physical reality? Well, um, it certainly seems to be the case that physical reality cannot be in contradictory states at the same time and in the same Why? sense. Why? Because we observe it? That's, that's one good reason. I have never observed a single counterexample, nor do I know of anybody that has ex observed a single counterexample. Okay, could it be possible then that you could have a square circle in physical reality? Depends what you mean by possible. I'm not sure is that it, I... Is, okay, um, when I mean possible, if I say something like, is it possible that I go walk down the driveway and take the trash out? Is there anything uh, that would be a, 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 a literal impossibility. It couldn't be done. Maybe, maybe we could say something like, given the laws of physics, is it possible for me to flap my arms and go to the moon? No, mm -hmm. given the system, that's not possible. So mm -hmm. is, it, is there even a remote possibility that there might someday be a square circle? We haven't observed it yet, but the year 3000, a square circle will pop into physical existence. I don't think so. Are, is it, is, are you sure? Is there any possibility? Uh, again, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure that I understand, I don't, I don't know sure that I really understand possibility, uh, but I don't know. I mean, if you want to push me into a corner, I think I'm going to say yes. There is, you're certain it's impossible. No, 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 that, that, that there is some possibility, I suppose, just because I don't uh, know. Okay, so this I is- I highly, 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 highly doubt it. Okay, so you think it could be possible just, I just want to be crystal clear mm -hmm. that in the physical world, there is something that has the properties that it does not have. That I see no reason to think that that's possible, but could uh, it be? I doubt it. But you're not certain. I mean, when we're talking about this level, when we're talking about philosophical debate with a certain level of, you know, rigor about what we're talking about, uh, I don't apply certainty to anything. Okay, um, so. For some, of the, for, some, for some of the skeptical reasons that we talked about earlier. So this is where it comes down to language, because what I'm claiming is if you unpack the meaning of words, you will discover that what we mean by the term not and negation implies necess necessarily that you could not have negation and affirmation together at the same time, not just in physical reality, but all kinds of reality. So if we say, something has properties and we say something does not have properties here's a set of properties affirmation this thing has it here's a, here's the same set of properties negation does not have what we mean by those terms 
means, means, cannot be put together. Otherwise, we wouldn't use the term. We wouldn't use the term not. Can you be happy and sad together? Yeah, okay, you could probably be happy and sad. So, so we wouldn't say these are mutually exclusive. There are some things which are explicitly mutually exclusive, right? Being square, having, let's say, uh, if we're talking about physical world, having six sides and not having six sides. If it's the case that there's an object that has six sides, what we mean to say is that object does not have more than six sides or less than six sides. That's exactly what we mean. So to say, maybe it could be the case that some, an object with six sides doesn't have six sides is, I think, to make a linguistic error, a logical error, of course. Yeah, that, uh, again, I, I don't want to argue against you on this because my, 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 my resistance to saying, my resistance to saying certain comes from, from blanket uh, skepticism that has nothing to do with the specifics of what you just said. So everything, well, most of what you just said, I completely agree with. And I, you know, I'm as certain as I am of anything that uh, there will never be a square circle in physical reality. Are you, are you certain that you doubt some things? See, I'm not certain of that claim because uh, I'm not sure that you, because, because there's so much that's assumed in it. For example, you said you, you refer to me. So you're yeah. assuming, for example, that it's coherent to say that I am a distinct object. I don't, I, you know, that doesn't seem, uh, that isn't, I'm not certain of that by any means. Um, so the thing is, you know, a lot of times it might, you, you can put together a statement that seems like, come on, it's just the meaning of the words um, that you can't deny it. But a lot of times what happens is, you know, you smuggle in concepts that aren't getting questioned. So, you know, am I having doubts? Well, of course I want to say, yes, I'm, I, I doubt, right? But then again, am I sure that I am a coherent thing? I'm not. And if, and if it turns out that who, I am, who is it? if it turns out that I am not, okay, then, then I'm not having doubts. Then, then, then the thing that we're claiming has doubts doesn't actually exist. So you cannot coherently say, I'm not sure if I, if I exist, right? You, there are certain things which are inescapable. That's, uh, well, no, that, that's, that's, that's ridiculous because there are people, uh, mentally ill people, who actually do doubt if they exist. It's completely ridiculous to say and, that it's impossible there, to doubt that. Okay, uh, maybe let me clarify. Um, one can be certain of one's existence. You might be unaware that you exist, but that is a, something that you can be certain of. So just because some people are not aware of that doesn't mean that somehow it's not something that can be known. Some people are unaware of all kinds of certain truths or advanced I mean, but, but, see, but see, the thing is, but, but think about the fact that there's so many, so much, so many terms we haven't, we haven't even like gotten square, right? Like, for we example, you're saying that I exist. What, you know, we haven't talked about what existence actually means, we, right? So there's a confusion about the, the role of language in statements. It mm -hmm. is not the case that we have to have this this dictionary in front of us to say, okay, what do we mean by all these words? Let's define everything linguistically before we open our mouths and say anything. That's not the way it works. You're, what, what language is is a way for you to communicate concepts. It doesn't really matter if you and I really agree on what I is. It's just you from your internal position can say coherently, I exist. And what I mean by I, that is- I can, But I can also say coherently, I am not quite sure what I am. Uh, and I'm also not quite settled on what exactly we mean by existence. So I can't tell you 100% certainly that I exist. We don't have to be settled on any definitions. Right? The, the, the pursuit of truth is an individual one. I have my own individual meanings for my words. And maybe nobody right, else yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, 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 yeah. Uh, But yeah, even internally, right? Even internally, I can, I can certainly, in my own deliberation, say not sure what I am and not sure what it means okay, to exist. But, so I'm not sure but, if I exist. But forget about the words then. Meditate on the contents of your own experience and you'll discover something is going on. Maybe you couldn't articulate it. Maybe you don't like the word something. Maybe you don't like going on. Irrelevant. You can have a concept about the nature of things, the nature of the contents of your experience. And then you can say, hey, I'm going to try to communicate these concepts. Maybe it's not going to be a perfectly precise communication. Okay, okay. Yeah, all right, all right. Sorry. So that's different from what you were asking before. Yeah, I, I'm, I feel pretty damn sure that there's some experience going on. Okay. 
it is it is certainly the case that there's some experience going on. I think everybody who is experiencing can have the same type of realization. Then the natural question is, is it the case then that somebody were to come along and say, it is not the case that experience is going on, would they be wrong? If I would say, there is no mental phenomena taking place right now, would they be wrong? Uh, sure, of course. I mean, Are you again, certain of it? Are you, again, you're not, you're not if you're, going, wait, like, but if you're if you're certain that the mental phenomena are going on then you must I didn't, be I, didn't, I didn't i said i was pretty damn sure okay, and again okay. i would I just, and, I, and i get and i would say again that I, that I would say that that person is pretty damn sure okay well it sounded like i thought you said a minute ago that you said again you were again because now you're asking me to talk about knowledge which is already a linguistic is already a concept expressed through language right so you want me to put aside the linguistic problem right so and just meditate on my non-linguistic experience, which I can do, but then you want you want me to translate that to a proposition by saying a, 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 a non-linguistic experience exists. The moment I say that, we have now translated to language, and I am now not sure about the coherence of what is being said. So, William, yeah. could I inter could I interject? Please. I'm curious, is some of what you're saying with with regard to this, or your particular strain of the dialectism uh, perspective, is kind of what you're saying that because because we are limited in our knowledge, our rationalist systems must inherently contain some level of contradiction. So language is not is imperfect because we are imperfect, therefore it must contain some level of contradiction, because I would find that to be generally true in, in, in as much as it doesn't provide a, to a sum total to the universe. Does that make any sense? Yeah, so, so sure, I, I, do, I, do, I do think that language is uh, imperfect. Um, and, uh, I do think that essentially, again, I kind of hesitated to use that word, but, but basically I do think that, that the reason that you can get contradictions like, like the liars is because language has developed in a way where there's sort of still some like errors built into how we, right. how we do that, so, how we represent. Well, so it would be in essence, you have this, we have this vast description or set of descriptions that we've all strung together and somewhere buried in there is various implied um, X does not equal X type st class statements. Yeah, specifically with the liar, what I think is going on is that our language has developed in such a way that true and false um, preclude each other, right? They're mutually exclusive, but it has also uh, developed in such a way that we can make self-referential statements. Uh, and so that is, has, that's what sort of leads to this problem where you get this contradictory sentence. Um, it, uh, all that's happened is that, you know, essentially our language has, 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 been, has, has developed in such a way that we, can, that we can do something that involves true and false doing something that they're not supposed to do the way that, the way, you know, the way that our language developed, so. Yeah, because well, it, seem, it seems to me like that would be by necessity inherent in all language, in any, anything in a thumb to, because it, this goes back to my um, simulation concept. Because we are not some total of all existence, then therefore our descriptions are incomplete. Every description we use is incomplete. I agree with that. And so as a result... There's always this sort of approximation that is going on when we're, yeah, when we're, when we're speaking. And, and, and imp you know, yeah. the sort of imprecise that, impreciseness that builds in, decision, it eventually compounds so when you start making complex sentences. The, yeah, I agree with that. The imprecision induces the appearance of contradictions, but when those appear, those are evidence of the language limitation. So a perfect, in essence, a, a perfect language could not possibly have contradictions. It would be impossible because the description, each description would be total. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a language that was limited to 
statements about physical reality that are comprehensive and describe all of physical reality uh, would not, I would imagine, would not have any contradictions. Yeah, yeah. like the, the illustration I might give would be like, um, when, we, when we say anything, when we say that is a dog, our definition is vague. Because if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, then you get into each individual you know, cell molecule in the dog, all yeah, all the way down to the most basic level, whatever that that is. And so, in essence, a perfect language would be incapable of having contradictions because every single description would be absolutely perfect. And so, at that point, it would essentially be the universe kind of describing itself, which would be weird, and or rather, it would be one with the universe, and it would be an identity, weird identity. So right, yeah, uh, yeah. Seems <laughs> seems it seems like we're all on the same page. We're just arguing about how to get onto that same page or something. I really think you should read. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but uh, you really should read Gödel Escher Bach. If you haven't, yeah, I'm uh, reading that right now, and it is incredible. And Nathan, you have to read it. It's insane. You're gonna good. love it. And it's so much where your head has been going on all these calls. You got to read it. Yeah, I, I, I don't see any real disagreement here at a fundamental level. I I, well, I, I'd like to jump in and say I see a huge, gigantic chasm of disagreement, and I'm certain that William is wrong. <laughs> 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 well, uh, the, but so, if, I, I, yeah, like, go ahead. If William is agreeing with what I'm saying. I think I'm agreeing with you, what you're saying. So something. Well, I, I'm claiming. The law well, of transitivity does not I, work. I, I, <laughs> there, are, there are certain objective truths. Uh, there are uh, logic has no contradictions in it. If you contradict yourself, you've made an error. The liar's paradox has nothing about the inherent problems with language is just a linguistic error there's no reason to be a dialetheist all, all of these propositions right i think no steve i think that's the claim that's that's where i'm kind of bridging the gap between the two of you and it's interesting because you're on in my screen you're on the opposite sides of me um, <laughs> i'm literally in between the two of you um, but i i'm saying that what with what language is if la as language gets more like a perfect language a perfect description of things would it would be impossible for it to have contradictions because it would only describe everything in its absolute perfection and so like all these abstractions that we make are a result of our finiteness and our limitations um, as a tiny subset of the universe. And so I think that's, that's kind of where I am and that I can see where both of you are coming from. That, like I'm saying that the possibility that language can invert on itself the way, the possibility that we can create a sort of a mathematical algorithm that just collapses on itself or implodes or th these sorts of things are the very fact that we can do that is because of the limitations of our language. And so you, I would say you're right in the sense that contradictions can exist in reality, but because our language is imprecise, out of the imprecision comes the ability to say absurd things, comes I mean, the ability to say, to, to write X does not equal X. Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of that, but I don't have a problem as much with natural language. We can clear things up pretty easy without saying, well, sometimes contradictions exist. Um, I don't think it's the case that contradiction is inescapable, and I don't think it's the case that you can have a coherent, a coherent yeah. thought about a square circle. That doesn't make any sense. We can yeah, say those I, words, but you can't clearly think about that, and I think I, that's where the I, disagreement is. I think you're absolutely right, but I think, I, and I think well, where William is coming from is basically agreeing with you. He's just saying that, yes, we can write down those absurdities because we're flawed. Well, so um, I, I want to ask, I want to say one more thing about that, but there are so many other paradoxes that I was hoping <laughs> like, you know, the most fun. No, it is. It's the most fun. It's the most important. I just want that all of them to be resolved too. So, I, so I, I wanted to have the goal in mind of getting any shred of doubt 
uh, away here, but I, I want to ask one more, one more thing though. Um, if Nathan is correct, then Mike, then I want to see what you think about this, William. Um, I am saying that you cannot have a coherent concept of a square circle, that you can say those words, but you cannot have a clear and distinct perception of what that even means. There is no such existent thing in your mind. Okay, it sounds like Nathan and, and, and is saying that that's his position, that's my position. Are you saying that that's what you disagree with? I do disagree with that. Uh, I don't think I can have a picture of a, of a, of a square circle in my mind. That, I, I certainly can't. I've tried. Cer certainly. <laughs> uh, this cer when you said certainly, I, I want to answer your question and not repeat the, 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 yeah. like the skeptical thing again. Okay, okay. Uh, um, <laughs> so yeah, I do say the word certainly, just like okay. offhandedly the okay. way we say words. Fair enough. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so I think part of the disagreement is about the requirements for meaning, right? So um, I don't think that I need to be able to picture something in order to understand what it means. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I take meaning to be, you know, essentially like, a sense of understanding, a sense of like, you know, I, I, I kind of like, I know what you're saying, right? Like I, a sense of getting a, some information from, 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 from what's from a, from a proposition, right? So what, or, uh, so when we talk about a square circle, uh, I understand that to mean, again, you know, an object, it's got these properties. I know what those properties are. I know what it is for, 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 for properties to be instantiated in an object. And so for that reason, I understand the idea of a square circle. Uh, it happens to be a contradictory idea because it has two properties that are actually mutually exclusive, right? But that doesn't stop me from just having the concept in my head of this thing that has, that has mutually exclusive properties, right? Again, that can only happen in my head because you can't instantiate that because they're, hello, they're mutually exclusive, right? But that's the magical thing about the brain is that it can, might, it can just put concepts together. Might I attempt to translate? Okay, translation, it's just, it's, you can have a statement X equals not X. X, mean, X means something to me, not, or equals and not X. Those all mean something to me. Yeah. I have that and then I, hold those together. I make a mental image of what it would look like if I wrote that on the paper, basically. And so I, quote, understand the concept in the sense that I understand each of those parts, but the parts put together are an absurdity and we all agree that they are an absurdity. But he's just saying, I think William's just saying that we can understand each of the parts, we can arrange them and in, in essence, we can create an algorithm in the same way you can create some mathematical thing that kind of implodes on itself um, algorithmically. We can create an algorithm that is absurd. And so in that sense, in a loose sense, we understand an absurd algorithm. Yeah, I mean, but, so it's, it's one thing to say I understand cons like constituent words and what they mean. It's another thing to say, I understand putting them all together. An excellent example of this that comes up all the time is in theism. There's a traditional orthodox conception of God which says he's omnipotent, omnibenevolent, um, omnipresent, and all these things. Now, some people make the argument that those properties are mutually exclusive. Some people specifically say it can't be an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God meaning he can't be all powerful and all loving because he would have the power to prevent evil from happening and yet evil still happens. So the, what they're saying is these two things are uh, mutually exclusive. Therefore, that uh, they can't be integrated that type, that, that God doesn't exist. Now, whether or not that's a good argument is uh, for another time, but the point is to say you can understand omnibenevolence. You can understand omni omnipotence. But if you're thinking this way, you can't understand them together because they imply an, a contradiction, or can God create a, a, a mountain so big that he can't move it? I understand the idea of creating a mountain, okay. I understand the idea of something being so big I can't move it, okay. But with the omnipotent uh, criteria, well, you've, you've put those in, you put this together in such a stew that I'm saying you can't make sense of it. It doesn't make any sense. It implies a contradiction. It doesn't make any sense. Of course. Yeah. So, so, so I, think, I think what's going on is that you have a stricter, um, yeah. 
requirement for meaning than I do, right? So for me, just the fact that I understand what those two things are, and I understand what it means for something to have two things, right? Like I understand what, what it means for, for, for God to be able to make a mountain. I understand what it means for something to not be able to move something. I understand what it means for something to be omnipotent, right? I understand what it means for something to have various properties at the same time. So I know all I need to know. Now, That's not true. It, so, so hold on. Now, is there a sense in which there's something about this that I can't quite explain? Of course, a hundred percent. There's definitely something about this that I can't explain. In fact, it seems impossible, right? And, and I think it is impossible. However, I understand everything that was said, right? And so, and so that's all it is. Like, I, just have, I think I have a weaker requirement for meaning. Yeah. And I think it's good to have this weaker requirement for meaning because there's a sense in which, you know, uh, he's omnipotent and there's a stone he can't move is of course contradictory and there's something about it you can't explain, it's impossible, etc. But there's something, there's a sense in which you understand that better than, you know, kangaroo five floor, right? Kangaroo well, five floor, there's, you, no, there's, there's no understanding there at all other than just like a thing, a thing, a thing. There's nothing about how they've been put together. Here you have a whole, a whole like uh, world of things that you do understand about it. It's just some, some aspect of it that you can't picture or understand. Right, I so I do think, found, okay. I think we found it, right? I think this is actually really getting to the heart of the matter. It sounds like what you're saying is, I understand all the ingredients that go into making a cake, therefore I understand cakes. Nope, that's, that's not saying. what I said. That's not what I said. Okay. That seems to be- Wait, Pause, pause, can okay. I okay. sort of translate? Okay, <laughs> keep, keep try translating here in between you guys, because um, think of it in an algorithmic manner, like a mountain, so big if could god if god's omnipotent could he make a mountain so big he can't move it right we are not thinking of, we're thinking of that in an algorithmic sense it's it's an absurdity but it's an absurdity to try and close the algorithm to stop it to take you know we have this concept of a mountain and making a bigger and bigger mountain we extend that kind of like how you'd say x you know y goes to infinity in, a, in, a, in an equation, it's, it's, a, it's essentially an algorithm. You're, say, you're repeating like an enlargement of a concept. And I think, Steve, what kind of what your definition of understanding is, is like a closed loop, or, or I'm sorry, not a closed loop, but a, clo a closed algorithm, an algorithm that reaches its endpoint. So, meaning, so when you say logarithm, logarithm that doesn't break, maybe. Yeah. Re same thing. I'd say it reaches an endpoint because like, so the, something like the, the wire paradox implodes on itself. There is no endpoint. There is no conclusion. And so as a result of that, it is absurd. But I think, and here, here's something that throws it into question or brings up an interesting question. I think maybe where William is coming from is that he's saying because like what I said with language of it being of the definitions being other than perfectly precise, he sees that as open-ended as well. And so that that has the imprecision of our definitions has its own sort of implosion element to it, or has, has a similar structural feature. Yeah, I am rejecting the notion that just because we understand words individually, that when they're all put together in the sentence stew, that we can have a coherent concept of something that contains a contradiction. That, that strikes me as a jump to say, I understand all the individual parts, therefore I can coherently put them together and make sense of it. Mm -hmm. So Why I believe that guys, um, um, I, I will, I really hate to do this, but I was supposed to leave half an hour ago. Uh, I am, I'm now, uh, a nine to fiver thanks to Praxis. So I gotta be up in the morning. Um, uh, Steve, yeah. totally side question. Where do you live? Uh, right now I'm in upstate New York, but in a few months I'm going to be moving down South. Oh man. All right. But sometime before you leave, I should meet with you in person. Um, Are you up north? I, I'm I'm not upstate, but I'm I'm in New York City, but it's not that it's not that right bad on. to make the the trip one way or the other. That'd be great. Um, 
Steve, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I understand that you think I'm a fool. Uh, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I get tremendous, tremendous value out of this. Um, and uh, yeah, th thanks for coming on. If you guys want to continue talking, uh, by all means, feel free. But I, I, I really got to go. Thanks for inviting me. It was great. I loved the conversation as well. All right. See you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night, William. <laughs>